remake of Cub Scouts, The Era of Light, which I'm really excited about this one because uh, this is our first ceremony where the girls that have earned it will get their Era of Light and your own L. Townsend that's a member here at the church has, is going to earn that Era of Light award. And then she's going to cross over with the rest of the Weeblos too that are the fifth graders that are transferring over into the uh, Boys and Girls Scout troop. And then Marcus has got some uh, announcements as well. Um, again, my name is Marcus McClellan. I'm the head cub master for PAC 90, and I just wanted to personally thank everyone uh, with Heritage Church for your continued support of our scouting program. Um, as Jason just said, there have been a lot of challenges with regard to how the programs are run. Uh, a lot of countries, I mean, I'm sorry, a lot of PACs and scout groups around the country have actually folded uh, because of the challenges um, of COVID-19. Um, despite all of that, our PAC, PAC 90, has continued to, uh, to thrive and, to, and, and we're still going strong. Um, this past fall, we were, we, uh, every month we had a community service project. We uh, did a Longleaf Trace trail cleanup uh, in conjunction with the city of Hattiesburg. Our scouts went out and cleaned a uh, stretch of the Longleaf Trace on one Saturday. Um, we also participated in a community service project packing boxes one month with the uh, Extra Table um, organization. Uh, we also worked with Habitat for Humanity at their inaugural mud dash run that they had in October where we handed out uh, medals and, and other awards with the, uh, for the finishing runners. We also um, led and executed a uh, scouting for food project that some of you may have seen was covered in the news. In November, we raised nearly 3,000 pounds of food uh, to benefit Edward Street Fellowship Center. Uh, what else did we do? I think we also, in December, our scouts uh, colored and wrote about 160 Christmas cards that were then donated to every resident at the Veterans uh, Center in Collins. Uh, and we also donated some, several to the Edwards Street Fellowship Center. So we're very proud that our scouts throughout this challenging time have continued to serve the community uh, and uh, on behalf of not only scouting, but on behalf of Heritage Church. And we just want to thank you all again for all of your support. And we are very fortunate to have many dedicated scout leaders and parents that are uh, dedicated to what we're trying to do with our kids, teach them the principles uh, of scouting. And we look forward to continue to going strong throughout these times. So thank you all. And I'll give the mic back to Jason. Um, We'd like to invite you to come visit any of our units if you'd like to. Um, if you need any information from us, you can contact um, us at pat 90 hattiesburg at gmail.com. We have ages from kindergarten is our Lions group, goes all the way up through fifth grade in Cub Scouts. And then they go to the big scout troop, boys and girls, starting in sixth grade uh, until they can turn the age of 18, once they turn the age of 18. Um, they are done with scouting. But from kindergarten all the way through basically senior year of high school, uh, they can um, learn so much from scouting. And uh, if y'all have anybody y'all know that is interested, uh, contact us, and uh, we welcome in to our troop and pack at any time. So thank y'all very much for your love and support from Heritage United Methodist. Thanks, guys. We do want to take a little bit of, of time to recognize the scouts that are here with us today. So if you are a current scout that's here, I know you've all worn your uniforms. If y'all would please just stand so we can honor you for being here. <clears throat> and we want to thank everybody who's been a part of our scouting program here at Heritage. It's, a, it's an important piece of our ministry and our work here. So we thank you all for your volunteer work and, and all the good things that you're doing. 
A um, couple of announcements as we go into this today. We, uh, <clears throat> Scott and Leanne Jones, their baby is due this week. Uh, so uh, it's scheduled for Wednesday, and so we're looking forward to that, and we're excited for them. But for the next two Sundays, the Upper Room Sunday School class is hosting a diaper shower for Leanne and Scott, and that round table in the narthex out there is decorated for you to leave cards of congratulations or diapers and that kind of thing. So. Uh, I, I know they'll appreciate any and everything that you uh, are willing to give. They're really excited and nervous, too. So, uh, Also, our backpack ministry, we want to thank you for the wonderful response to our foster child backpack program. All the backpacks have been claimed now, and we will have a special dedication celebration service for them on February 28th. So if you've not yet turned your backpack in, we ask that you just bring the backpack with you on February 28th. And we're going to dedicate those and have a special prayer and blessing of those backpacks. And then also our Heritage t-shirts and sweatshirts are on sale right now. So you can go to our Facebook page to order those. The proceeds there will benefit Edward Street and Bread Basket. And then we have a big announcement to make. Our transition team met this Wednesday night. And they, uh, after discussing and having a... Um, a long talk, we've decided to get back to Sunday school on Sunday, April the 11th, and that's the week after Easter, and so it'll be children, youth, and adult Sunday schools will be back, um, and so it's totally, still totally up to the class and whether or not they meet, so if you're a part of a Sunday school class, make sure you check with, with your teacher and your class to see if y'all will be meeting back in the building on April 11th. I know the children and youth we do plan to meet. So, um, And now, if you would, please stand and join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. Uh, at this time, if our ushers would please come forward, we are going to receive the offering.
Amen. You may be seated. As we come to this time of prayer, I want us to just take uh, an extra minute to remember those who are recovering from this latest storm. Uh, you know, we have experienced hurricanes, we've experienced tornadoes. Uh, the devastation from the ice storm and the snowstorm in Texas through Arkansas, Louisiana, up into North Mississippi is just kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, the, the lack of power, the lack of water, uh, the, the pipes that are ruptured, so it's like a combination of a flood and just uh, so many things at one time. And we're going to make plans this week to partner with at least a couple of uh, congregations to do some distribution and to help in recovery. I have a good friend who's a pastor of an inner city church in Houston, and uh, he uh, has a huge homeless population. 60% of his church is homeless, and they have about 7,000 members. And they are devastated. The apartments that they have for transitional living is without water, uh, and they're the place that a lot of these distributions are not getting out because people don't have transportation. So we'll be partnering with St. John's. And then in Jackson, we're gonna try to find a partner there. Their water system is still on boil water notice, and there's several people there that are uh, lacking. So keep them in your prayers, and just uh, remember this is, I mean, we're talking millions of people who have uh, literally had their lives turned upside down and are uh, trying to recover in the midst of the pandemic. So please um, do that. And I, I do wanna continue to urge you uh, to, if you get a chance to get the inoculation, do that. Our numbers are dropping, we're hopeful, but don't, don't give up. We're, you've done such an incredible job and I just wanna thank you for that. Uh, you have uh, just, followed all of the things we've asked you to do. And because of that, uh, we, have, we have weathered this very well. So thank you for that. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we live our lives so many times taking things for granted and then things happen and we're awakened to how much we really have that we never pay attention to. When a pandemic takes us away from each other and uh, creates things we have to do in our life that we're not used to doing, when we find ourselves in rhythms and routines that have shaken every normal we know, we suddenly realize how much of our everyday routine is such a gift. And Father, when things like this ice storm happen, we're reminded that though every day we get up and turn the lights on and turn the water on and drink clean water every day, that's a gift. And so not only do we lift up those who were affected by the storm, we pray that you would humble us and remind us that every day is a gift from you. That every day there are thousands of gifts we partake of that we just don't even pay attention to. And so as the sun shines outside and we feel the warm temperatures return, we are reminded that sometimes life's most simple pleasures, most simple gifts are the most important. Lord, be with the leaders that are trying to navigate the tragedies at every level. Be with us as a community as we seek to stay safe and at the same time stay connected. And be with us as followers of Jesus that in the midst of this, our relationship with you would grow deeper and stronger. Our desire to serve you and love you and worship you would continue to deepen. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Good morning. The scripture this morning is from Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. So here is what I want you to do with God's help. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you develops well-informed maturity in you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Jim. Most of you know that starting last week, we began a series for Lent that's built around Rick Warren's purpose-driven 
life. And there are copies of this. This is a, not only just a great study and call, but it's got daily devotions for every week. And as we're coming to you, we're building our sermons around each movement in this idea that's very central here at Heritage, and that is we're all called by God to help the kingdom come. That each of us have something to bring to the body of Christ. And that in order for that to happen, there are certain things that have to happen in our lives in order to get us ready for that. In the series of sermons that they recommend, this scripture, which most of you know is one of my favorites from Romans 12, is the perfect example of where you start if you want to answer the call of Christ. And that starting point is simply not to go to culture or this world to find direction, but rather to go to Christ. One of the stories that they had in the sermon was uh, a story that was in the Chicago Tribune by one of their writers, Mike Royko. It's an older story, you'll hear this. But it's about a guy named Bill Mallory. Bill uh, told his story in the paper that he was on a quest to find meaning in life. And he had tried everything he could do, including going to India. And Jim Parrish, you're going to like this. So he was traveling on his road to one of his destinations, and he saw this Chevron sign. And it was this old sign, and what it said was, as you travel, ask us. So he pulled into the Chevron station and he looked at the attendant that came out. It was a time when they still pumped your gas and checked your oil and cleaned your window shields. And he said, what's the meaning of life? And the guy looked at him and said, look, I've only been working here a week. I don't know anything about that and so he made it this kind of ongoing joke where every time he would come to a chevron station he would pull in and whoever attendant came out to clean the window shields and put his gas in he'd go what's the meaning of life and the answers were like well you know I don't really go to church myself or or I I don't remember that being in the manual and he stopped time and time again so many times that he got reported to the corporate office and he got a phone call And the phone call said, sir, we understand that you've stopped at many of our service stations and asked questions that we haven't answered satisfactorily. Why don't you write that question in a letter and mail it to us? So he did. Dear Chevron, what is the meaning of life? He sent it off. He waited and waited. One day he went out to the mailbox and sure enough, there was a letter from Chevron and he opened it up and it was a credit card application. What is the meaning of life is something that in one way or another we all ask ourselves. Why am I here? What difference do I make? What is it that will really make me happy? All of those questions are brother and sister questions that have to do with our identity. And what Paul so beautifully says in this message translation of Romans 12 is... The way that we find our purpose and meaning in life is to give our life to Christ. Seems kind of paradoxical, doesn't it? I mean, Jesus had foretold this time and time again. In order to save your life, you must lose it. In order to live, you have to die to self. There is this movement that from creation is said, out of relationship with God, our life loses its real meaning. And any other thing that we seek to put in the place of God is never enough. There aren't enough new iPhones to bring you meaning in life. There isn't a house big enough, a pool big enough, a car beautiful enough, a bank account with enough money in it. The 
that can bring you meaning in life. And so the practical question becomes, so how, how is it that we build a relationship with Christ that allows us to begin to discover our real purpose? Well, for those of you who are visiting our Methodists, I'm, I'm going to share a little bit about ourselves. When you join the United Methodist Church, we ask everybody, really it's basically six questions, five formally. These questions are asked not to give you a license to sit in the pew or come to worship or get all the wonderful benefits that come with being a member of heritage. They're really a roadmap, habits, to begin to solidify your relationship with Christ so that as you do that, God is able to give you direction in your life, to call you in your life, and to fill you with his purpose. So what are those things? First, you have a true relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not some t-shirt or cliche. It means that somewhere in your life, you like Saul have encountered the risen Christ and he has convinced you to follow him. Now, for each of us, that looks really different. Not every encounter with Christ does some knock you to your knees. Why are you kicking against the goads experience? For some of us, it means we were raised in a home where Christ was so present that we just got to know him because he lived in our house. And the people we lived with loved him. And we fell in love with him because we got to know the scripture and we got to know what it was like to live the life of Christ. But however the encounter happens, you cannot find meaning in your life without a relationship with God in Christ. The second thing we say is that you have to have a prayer life. You know, probably in my ministry, one of the most misunderstood or misinformed elements of a relationship with God is what prayer is. For a lot of people, we grow up that it's words. And I've had person after person say, Brother Steve, I don't know that I say the right words. I don't know that I pray the right way. Friends, it's not about words. Prayer is about a relationship. Prayer is just simply about honest communication. You don't have to use a single thee or thou or thine To have a prayerful relationship with God is this sense of going to God and speaking directly to God from your heart. But the part that's most misunderstood is you have to listen for God to speak to you. Let me say that again. You have to listen for God to speak to you. To you. So many times my prayers are simple, fast dashes. Dear Lord, I need help with this. Dear Lord, help me understand that. Dear Lord, please take care of so and so. And then I run along next. One of my worst habits as a husband is Cindy and I'll be in a conversation and I'll leave the room distracted by what I'm going to do next. And I'll come back and she'll say, did you hear anything I said? And I'll go, I I've done this a thousand times, but I still give the same stupid answer. Yeah. Well, then what did I say? Uh, well, 
I was really in the other room, and I did, you know, that's how a lot of us pray. Dear God, please, 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 please. And then we're gone off to the next thing. We don't stay to hear the response and to interact, to get the benefit of the conversation. If you want to hear the call of God, oh, guess what? You've got to hear the call. You've got to receive the directions. You've got to engage that God in a real way. The other thing we have to do is be present. <laughs> I've wrestled with that almost my whole ministry. What does it mean to be present? I mean, I think about being in class and your teacher calling roll. Steve Castile, here. So many times we think of presence as physically being in proximity. But most of us know that just because we're standing here does not mean we're fully present. You know what I mean? So not only does our openness and direction of God depend on our willingness to have conversation with God, it really means we have to be present when we're with God. And we have to be present with God. You know the hymn, and he walks with me and he talks with me. That's about presence, not only God's presence with us, but our willingness to be present with him. Think about the separation of Adam and Eve from God. What happened after they had taken a bite of the apple? What did they do? They hid. You know, we're still hiding. A lot of people hide in their work. They hide in their habits. They hide in their busyness. And they're not present for God to do his work with us. Prayers, presence. The next two uh, I'll, I'll wed together, gifts and service. What that simply means, you know, a lot of people say, oh, now the preacher's here. This is the thing that preachers do, gifts. He's asking for money. That's part of it. It's a little part of it. You see, part of why we ask people to give money is to help people understand that money is not God. Money cannot save you. Yeah, you need it. But it's not the most important thing in life. Gifts and service offered to Christ are that humbling of ourselves which say, God, everything that I have, I know is yours, and I'm acknowledging that. Every talent I have, every gift I have, every connection I have, every resource I have, I place that at your feet. That's a way of worshiping God, not a way of paying your faith tax. Or buying your pew. It's so important that God is important enough to you that you're willing to lay everything at his feet. And to make the outward and visible testimony that you are more important than my house, you're more important than my cable TV, you're more important than my cell phone, you're more important than my job. You are God to me. The final element that helps us worship God and prepare ourselves to receive God's call is that our witness is our worship. What does that mean simply? You can tell what a person loves most by the way they live. That's why when Paul was writing this verse and, and whenever Peterson beautifully translates it, what he says is, here's what I want from you. Take your every day walking around, eating, sleeping, drinking life. Take your life and give it to me. The way you live is the greatest gift you can give back to God. And you want to know what else? The way you live 
is your testimony to the people around you of what kind of person you are and what you care about most. It's lived out, consciously or unconsciously, in everything you do. How you treat other people, how you interact with people at work. It's so funny how we can take our life and think we can split it in half. Well, I have to act a certain way at work, or I have to act a certain way with my friends, or I have to act a certain way. When Christ calls us to integrity and to not be split by the temptation as Paul said, to fit into this culture and to let it rob us of who we were meant to be. In that second chapter of Acts, when the church was growing like crazy and people were coming, trying to find out what had happened to the folks who had encountered the gospel, people were added to their number daily. Not because everybody could stand out on the balcony like Peter and preach, but because they watched how they treated each other. They watched how they cared for the people around them. They watched how they lived and their witness became their worship, which became the winsomeness that made people want to come to Christ. The first call in our life is the call to follow Christ. The call to give ourselves completely to him. And the call to understand that until we do that, we don't have life. I love the way that passage ends. Because when you give your life to Christ, he will change you from the inside out. As opposed to how he started the passage in, in the King James Version, it's translated this way. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your spirit. To be in Christ is not to look like this world. It's to look like Christ. Christ. And if we want to follow him, if we want to live into our best life, then we have to take our everyday walking around, eating, sleeping, drinking life and use it to glorify God. And then God begins that miraculous work inside of us. Peterson puts it this way. He will develop a maturity in you that the world cannot. This week, my invitation is this. Take a look at your life. Your everyday walking around, eating, sleeping, drinking life. And if, if you have a hard time keeping it up, if, if you keep a calendar or a day timer or on your phone have scheduled stuff, if you have a bank account or a credit card account, then just kind of look at the testimony of your life as to where you spend your resources, where you spend your money, where you spend your time. And ask yourself, am I conformed to this world? Or am I being transformed so that the kingdom can come and God's will can be done? Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you offer us an incredible gift in life. It is abundant life itself. Help us to understand that that abundant life does not come until we've given our life to you as our offering of worship, as our sacrifice of love, as our submission to your will. 
Lord, forgive us when we let the world get the better of us. We let the world determine our morals and actions and transactions. Give us the courage to step back and give it all to you. And understand that's in losing our life that we save it. Lord, we don't have to understand it. Help us just do it. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close, I'm going to ask you to stand. We want to thank the scouts again for being here with us. Um, We appreciate what y'all do. And we appreciate what you leaders teach these young men and women as they grow in character and in life. This week, look at your life. Conformed, being transformed. And here's what I want to say. Sometimes it's hard to get from here to here. Don't worry. Scott, John, myself, Sam, we're trained professionals. We can help you find your way. So call us if you're struggling, if you're looking for direction, if you need a change. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So go and live loved in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.